On the evening of March 18th, 1965, at the exclusive restaurant Ile de France in Rome, a large man in his 40s was feasting on lamb and oysters, sitting next to an attractive Italian opera singer. The street outside crawled with paparazzi, waiting for the man to walk out. The wait was in vain, however, and just before midnight, the man collapsed, never to wake up again. He was not a famous actor or a movie producer. He was a deposed monarch, King Farouk of Egypt, and one of our main protagonists for today's episode. This is the story of the plot that eventually led to his overthrow and paved the way to the Suez Crisis of 1956. I'm your host David, and this is The Cold War. King Farouk of Egypt was at the center of a little-known CIA operation in 1952. Its codename is too rude to be mentioned without risking upsetting the YouTube censors and the potential for advertisers. This set isn't free, you know. Anyway, let's just say that it rhymes with Project Fat Fudger. I could also paraphrase it as Project Corpulent Copulator. But I will use Project Double F from now on. Fat fucker. The operation was masterminded by CIA agent Kermit Kim Roosevelt, grandson of President Theodore Roosevelt. Its aim was to pressure the King of Egypt into accepting some progressive reforms for his country to help ensure Egypt remained in the Western world. Or at least that was the intended aim before the plan took an unexpected turn. Now, at the beginning of the 1950s, President Truman's administration needed a stable ally in the Middle East to protect U.S. oil supplies. Egypt was considered to be the keystone of the region, but by the end of the 1940s and beginning of the 1950s, the country was in turmoil. King Farouk, a once beloved boy king, was now at the nadir of popularity. He was opposed by the popular Waft Party, by the local communists, and by the Muslim Brotherhood for his perceived subservience to the British. He was despised by young officer cadres who believed he was responsible for the 1948 defeat against Israel. And he was generally criticized for his excessive and decadent lifestyle. He was rumored to have had numerous affairs and to feast on 600 oysters a day. Nice gig if you can get it, I guess. By late 1951, American ambassador to Cairo, Jeffrey Caffrey, clearly stated his concerns to his superior Secretary of State Dean Acheson. Egypt was gradually descending into chaos, torn by rival factions and under the chaotic leadership of the king. It was felt that such a position of weakness would give the USSR a window of opportunity to extend its influence into the region. Acheson tasked CIA officer Kermit Roosevelt to study the problem and find a solution to either stabilize the country, bring it into the western sphere of influence, or both. Kim was Teddy Roosevelt's grandson and was considered a prize asset to the CIA. At the age of 26, he had entered the Office of Strategic Services, the forerunner of the CIA, and had been one of the planners for the invasion of Italy in 1943. After the war, he had left intelligence work to represent American companies in the Middle East and lobby Washington on behalf of Middle Eastern governments. During these years, he had accumulated vital contacts in the region thanks to his talent for befriending kings, tribal leaders, and heads of state. In 1950, Kim returned to the fold, joining the CIA. Considering his experiences, it was only natural that his tasks involved damaging the Soviet sphere of influence in the Middle East. Throughout January of 1952, British forces stationed at Suez were targeted by guerrilla attacks of escalating intensity. These attacks were encouraged by the Waft ruling party, carried out by both the Muslim Brotherhood and local communists, with training and weapons sometimes provided by the free officers. This was a secret organization composed of young nationalist officers, led by two heroes of the War of 1948, General Mohammed Naguib, and the real power behind the curtain, Colonel Gamal Abdul Nasser. The violence reached its peak on the 25th of January with the Battle of Ismailia, in which British forces clashed with Egyptian police, causing at least 50 casualties. The following day, riots erupted in Cairo in what became known as Black Saturday. 
Mobs burnt down 475 buildings, all owned by foreign nationals. That same afternoon, Ambassador Caffrey telephoned King Farouk, advising that he bring in the army immediately to quell the riots. Farouk took action only two hours later, but he did take the opportunity to dismiss the anti-British Watt cabinet, a move made to appease London and prevent a possible invasion. The events of Black Saturday also sparked action back in the US. Over Sunday tea at Georgetown, Deputy Director of the CIA Alan Dulles met with Kim Roosevelt and agreed it was about time they intervened to save Farouk. Kim and CIA colleague Miles Copeland had been working on such a plan since late 1951 at Acheson's request. Their plan was to replace the corrupt political system in Egypt with a progressive dictatorship under King Farouk, one that would be amenable to American control. This progressive dictatorship would have restored stability to the country, first of all by preventing a total revolt, and then by preventing the king himself from installing his own despotic autocratic rule, one that would have led to, well, guess what, a total revolt. The outcome of that, of course, would have been to throw Egypt into the open arms of Moscow. Miles Copeland came up with the unofficial name of Project Double F. As you can likely guess, the king was a big man. In February of 1952, Kim traveled to Cairo and met with Farouk, using his already tested skills in schmoozing Middle Eastern elites. Kim proposed a series of reforms which could have helped the king consolidate his power and put an end to political chaos. But the king proved either unwilling or simply incapable of carrying out such reforms. There were only two pieces of advice which he carried through. First, the king had bribed the Muslim Brotherhood to get them to support the monarchy. Then Farouk had requested military assistance from the US via Ambassador Caffrey. More precisely, the king wanted the US to assist in the creation of three armoured police divisions in Cairo and Alexandria. The official reason was to stop communism, but the real reason was to create a Praetorian Guard that would ensure Farouk's rule, even without the support of the army. By March of 1952, it became apparent to Kim and the CIA that their project was turning into a complete fudge up. Farouk was dismissing prime ministers at the rate of one a month, effectively ruling by decree. Kim's fears were materializing as the king was becoming a despot. The CIA and State Department needed to find a new ally within Egypt to ensure stability and keep the Soviets at bay. The only two choices powerful enough were the Muslim Brotherhood and the army. The Brotherhood would likely never cooperate with a non-Muslim foreign power, so the military was the only choice. So as I mentioned earlier, dissent was brewing within the army, spearheaded by the free officers. Discontent was particularly rife amongst junior officers who resented some of the senior officers who had been handpicked by Farouk. These high-ranking officers were suspected of embezzlement during the 1948 war to the extent that their corruption had contributed to Egypt's defeat. Caffrey had heard rumors of an imminent coup from a reliable source, the Indian military attaché Colonel D.K. Pallet, who had met several times with Nasser and the free officers. The ambassador reported the rumors to Roosevelt, who in the meantime had returned to Washington. Kim then dispatched Copeland to Cairo to meet with the scheming officers. Their goal was to identify a potential new leader to replace Farouk, a charismatic non-aligned ruler in the mold of Nehru or Tito, who could keep Egypt away from Soviet influence. When Copeland arrived in Cairo, he was in for a couple of surprises. He was expecting to discuss a coup d'etat, but he came across some coup de théâtre. Remember when Kim had told the king to bribe the Brotherhood? Well, it turns out that Farouk had also schemed with the Brotherhood to plan his own coup d'etat. With Brotherhood's support, the king would have become the undisputed leader of a new fundamentalist state. He had even gotten himself recognized as a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. But now for twist number two. The Brotherhood, while acting nice to the king, had gone behind his back and given the king's bribe money to disgruntled army officers. 
Their plan was to forge an alliance to overthrow Farouk for good. It was clear that nobody wanted Farouk to stay, and that the military were going to lead the charge. In late March, Roosevelt was back in Cairo to meet Colonel Nasser. The two hit it off and agreed on some core principles for the upcoming and now inevitable coup. One, a military takeover was the only course of action to avoid a popular revolt, led either by the Brotherhood or the Communists. Two, the US would not interfere with the Free Officers' plot, and if needed, they would deter the British from intervening. And three, a newly formed military government would pay at least lip service to democracy to appease US public opinion. Kim returned to Washington and briefed Secretary Acheson who agreed with the new course that Double F had taken. Now, back in February, Acheson had been convinced by Roosevelt to fund and arm Farouk's own Praetorians, an order that now needed to be quickly cancelled. So this now takes us forward to April the 24th, 1952. On this date, the CIA and State Department's involvement in the Egyptian coup was sanctioned by the Truman administration and the National Security Council. Their policy, 129-1, urged the US to influence the process of political change into channels that will affect the least compromise of Western interests and will offer the maximum promise of stable non-communist regimes. Over in Cairo, the situation reached a boiling point on the 20th of July. The fifth government in less than a year had just resigned, this time over King Farouk's refusal to appoint General Mohammed Naguib as defense minister. That was the spark that set the free officers in motion. On the night of the 22nd, while the king was at his summer residence in Alexandria, rebel officers took control of all major power centers in Cairo, both swiftly and without bloodshed. At 8 a.m. on the 23rd, U.S. Ambassador Caffrey received a panicked phone call from King Farouk, desperate for external help to quell the rebellion. I count on you to pass this message to the right people. The right people being the British. Unbeknownst to Farouk, however, Caffrey had already spoken to the free officers that same night. They had reassured him that US, British, and in general foreign interests would be safeguarded by the new leadership, but that any British intervention from Suez would be met with force. Caffrey informed his boss, Acheson, who immediately contacted London's foreign office, warning them that any intervention against the free officers would be disastrous. Keep in mind, in the event of a British intervention, the new military leaders would have put up a fight. But more importantly, removing the military government would have given free reign to the Muslim Brotherhood and the Communists, both who were much more hostile to British interests. With little involvement, and I dare say quite elegantly, the Team America of Roosevelt, Copeland, Acheson, and Caffrey had achieved their goal of removing King Farouk and installed a stable anti-communist regime. Fudge yeah. King Farouk officially abdicated on the 26th of July. Caffrey drove him to the Alexandria docks, from where he departed for his exile in Rome. The king lived extravagantly in the Italian capital, enjoying the attention of the paparazzi as the new king of the nightlife. And, well, we all know how that ended. Even with the king gone, Egypt remained a monarchy, as Farouk's infant son succeeded him as Fuad II. But clearly, the executive power laid with Naguib. And behind Naguib, there was Nasser. Nasser, as deputy prime minister and minister of the interior, worked hard to consolidate his own power. First, he had several notable members of the Waft Party incarcerated. Then, in January of 1953, he dissolved all political parties. In June of that year, he and Naguib dethroned baby Fouad, and in Naguib's words, the world's oldest monarchy had now become the world's youngest republic. In April of 1954, the colonel became prime minister, with Naguib still in charge as the president of that republic. But when, in October, a Muslim Brotherhood plot tried to assassinate Nasser, he took the opportunity to get rid of Naguib. You see, the former general had alleged ties to the Brotherhood, which made him a suspect in the assassination attempt. Nasser removed him from office and placed him under house arrest. Gamal Abdel Nasser had now performed the last act of his power play 
and his rise to the top was complete. What lay ahead for him would be a dam, a canal, and a crisis. But that's another story for another day. We hope you've enjoyed today's topic, and to make sure you don't miss those future episodes, please make sure you're subscribed to our channel and how about press the bell button. We can be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com. We're also active on Facebook and Instagram at The Cold War TV. If you enjoy our work, consider supporting us via www.patreon.com slash The Cold War or through YouTube membership. This is The Cold War Channel, and don't forget, the trouble with The Cold War is that it doesn't take too long before it becomes heated. <laughs>